So welcome, yes, here to the latest session in Greenit U. We are Greenit, the crowdfunding platform dedicated to creative work. Um, we look after theatre productions and stage plays. We look after live and recorded music. We're moving into gaming, but our origin story and our biggest chunk of business, and I guess it's fair to say our first love, my first love, is filmmaking. And it's a huge, huge pleasure to bring back for another one of our educational sessions Fantastic Katie McCullough from Festival Formula. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody watching who has been following these sessions so far, but we did one, I think, two to three weeks ago. As I say, freely available on our YouTube channel, again with Katie, in which she talked about festival strategy and how to optimise what you do with your planning. You've made your film and you want to get it out there in the world. You want to create the biggest impact. You want it to be seen and you want awareness from from the people that are going to really make that film fly for you so if you haven't seen that one nip back and watch our previous session on how to select your festivals how to maximize your impact in that in that strategy and how to best balance your budget when doing so so tonight's session is the second half uh, which fundamentally is going to be dealing with what you do in preparation to going to that festival and what you do when you're going to get there because you know it's a lovely thing you can just rock up and order a margarita and sit on the terrace and people will come and and adore you and your film but in fact like everything else in the world of film production the secret is that there are no free cocktails well there are free cocktails but you've got to put some work in if you if you want people to know about your film so anyway, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Katie, who's going to tell you about once you've chosen your film festivals, and more importantly, once that festival has chosen you, how are you really going to smash it? How are you going to really, really make an impact with your work and yourself as a filmmaker when you hit that festival circuit? So please take it away, Katie. Thank you very much for having me back. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. And I'm just going to reduce you all so I can see my words that I need to say. So um, lovely to be back. I think this is the next important thing after, as Peter said, about choosing the festivals that you're going to submit to. It's about being prepared as early as you can in the process just to make the rest of your circuit journey as smooth and as fruitful as you can. So today I'm going to talk about... Um, uh, what you can do to get yourself prepared and this is from materials but also just thinking about deadlines and getting yourself kind of organized so first one is where to start when i mean by where to start i mean actually kind of trying to think about the different types of festivals that you want to submit to which i touched on in the last session but i just thought it would uh, it bears repeating here just because it means that you begin to think about perhaps different types of assets that your film might need um, and also just making sure that you're really looking at those best suited festivals. So when we say assets, we basically mean anything that makes your film unique. Um, and that can be to the genre. It could be to the running time. It could be that it's a debut film or student production. Or it might be that you have a BIPOC director or a female producer. All of these areas are actually really, really beneficial when it comes to looking to the festival circuit. So again, the reason I've kind of straddled this between the two talks is this is actually quite important when it comes to the data that you're going to be telling film festivals about your film. So we kind of put together when anyone joins us what we call like a crib sheet, like a cheat sheet with everything that has all the information that you will need about your film. And the reason we do this is because not every film festival is listed on a submission platform. Sometimes they have an online form. You'll find that some of the big guns like Venice, Locarno, Berlinale, and even BFI um, and Cannes have their own website. So it means that you manually have to physically put in that information each time. And if there's more than one of you doing the submissions in your team, it's always good to have um, a source uh, document that you're all kind of reading from. Um, mostly so everything is correct, the runtime doesn't waver by a few seconds or 10, but also just so the spellings and, you know, the correct screener links being used. So some of these are also qualifying assets. So that's why it's really beneficial to kind of make sure that you've really thought out, like, what's the strengths of your film, but also where you can submit on the circuit. So I'll just go through a few of them. And so you have nationality of director. So sometimes a festival will require 
the nationality of the director to be of a certain origin to qualify. And that might be for the whole festival or it might be just for a particular category. So, you know, we've got a few films on our slate, which they may be UK productions, but they're actually kind of directed by a Swiss director or Finnish or Australian. So it means that you can kind of tap in to a few different things. Um, then there's uh, also in a similar vein, but production country as well. Again, sometimes festivals are very strict with their requirements that the film has to be from France for a French film festival or Australia for Australian film festival. Um, but it is also something to really lean into if you have that kind of element to your film. With co-productions, you can lean into both. So at the moment, we've got one which is um, a co-production between Denmark, France and US. So it means that we can kind of be a little bit nimble when we're looking to some festivals that require one of those countries to be the main source of um, production because it's a co-production. Um, budget is another one. Um, and sometimes festivals will stipulate what they consider to be a low budget and others what they tend to be a high. So there are some festivals that their main entire remit is on low budget productions. And it might be that they say per feature film, it has to be less than 250 euros per minute. Um, or for short film, it might say we consider low budget under 3000 pounds. Anything over 3000 will go into our higher budget category. So again, another area to explore. If you are working in the feature world, there are a lot of debut feature or first or second time feature categories dotted around the circuit, predominantly in America uh, with a few in Canada, but they generally tend to want those kind of low budget, proper indie, um, you know, just as an example, some places that do them is Miami Film Festival, um, Slam Dance have the first features, um, and they're, they're really kind of rife, uh, but obviously not everyone fits that criteria. Um, date of birth. It's not because they're being nosy. It's because sometimes, again, it is an eligibility criteria. So there are some festivals like uh, New Fest in Portugal where they want um, any, they want films uh, that are directed by somebody under the age of 35 who hasn't directed a feature yet. You have Women Over, Film, uh, Women Over 50 Film Festival, which wants um, narratives or creatives that are female over 50. And um, there are some festivals that have, you know, under 18 or over 65, it can vary. But again, it's another asset for you to exploit. Um, duration is another really handy one. Um, and we're not talking about running time today. We're just talking about it as an eligibility criteria. So every festival will be very different in that they have maybe perhaps separate categories for super short, kind of six minutes and under, or 15 minutes and under, or medium short, which is 20 to 25 and so on. Um, but again, just having all of this criteria in front of you. I mean, our pet, um, we take someone on as a submissions client. This kind of example PDF from the right is generally about six pages because we have a uh, crew, we have director statement, we have bios for producer, cinematographer and director. But it's just a place for you to put all that information so you've got something to revert to. More than often, um, you will get asked these questions on any submission platform that you utilise. Um, so I've been doing it 18 years and basically we created this based on all of the different platforms that we've used, including film festivals own websites and gone, right, we always get asked about this and we always get asked about that and we always need it to be a certain length. So I will say kind of it's really handy to have a document that's offline that you can share as a team, but also just so you have everything neat and tidy so you can grab it whenever. So... Submission methods in terms of where to find the festivals. So now you've kind of finished your film, you might be in the post-production stage and you're beginning to kind of weigh up what festivals that you want to hit. Um, the predominant um, platform at the moment is still Film Freeway. It covers quite a lot of ground. It doesn't cover everyone. That's the thing. You're never going to find a submission platform where every single festival is um, has everything uh, listed, mostly because there's probably like 40,000 plus and counting film festivals around the world. Not always festivals that want to shout about uh, receiving submissions because they're particularly niche, um, but also just because some festivals don't have that kind of budget to be able to list themselves on the submission platform. There is a bit of a cut going on. So you have to uh, pay to be listed. And then for every submission you receive, the submission platform takes a cut. So it can kind of add up for the smaller festivals. Um, Short Film Depot um, is a platform where all the festivals are vetted, so you know that they are decent, legit, real. Um, it's a mixture of festivals, predominantly European ones, 
It is the only platform that you could submit to Clement Ferrand on because they actually in part created that platform. Um, you'll find that some festivals uh, are on more than one, and that's either because they're trying to tap into a more international crowd, e.g. someone who only uses short film depot, and they want to be able to use Film Freeway because they want to be able to pull from maybe a more US heavy crowd or um, uh, North American in general. But also sometimes they will use different categories for different platforms. So you might find that on Film Freeway, there'll be a category for a festival, but it's only one because they're just looking to tap into one area. Um, Fest Home is another one that's quite popular. Um, does have a lot of duplicate festivals on in terms of when I say that, I mean festivals that are listed on Film Freeway, Short Film Depot, Fest Home. Um, if uh, it's a Spanish based website, so if you are working in the horror circuit, um, there are a lot of kind of smaller um, horror or genre based festivals on there in, in the Spanish territory, so it's always good to look at. I mentioned earlier, festival websites, they will actually just use their own uh, submission forms on their own website. So it's something that, you know, you don't click a few buttons and it's done. You actually have to input the data. Um, and the last one is email. It's rare, but you still get festivals, generally uh, kind of very niche ones, like either experimental or animation, where they literally just want you to email them a screener link. That might be your private YouTube listing link or your Vimeo and the password that corresponds to it. So. The important thing to say is that there's no one size fits all. You can't go to one stop shop and, and kind of do it. it. It's good to do your research, um, in which case I would kind of say Film Freeway is a good place to start um, just because there's a lot of festivals on there. But you might have a particular festival in mind that might not be on any of these and you have to go to them directly. So the next thing I really urge you to do, and um, we've just given a very brief snapshot of one of ours. This is just a mock up strategy that we create as a company. Um, but you don't have to have anything as flash as this or as colorful. You just basically need to have your information in one place that you can call on at any given time. Now, we've seen a lot of reiterations of Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, Google Docs. It's absolutely fine. The one thing I will stress to people is put them in deadline order because you will know when the festival is coming up for you to submit. And also it just means that you get all of the relevant information that's correct and up to date. So we always go by deadline date with our strategies. And then we include a column if it was selected or not selected. We also include a premiere column. Um, so this is just for you to be able to get a handle on, you know, what types of festivals you're aiming for if they have a very big premiere, but also some of those festivals that might conflict with each other. So, you know, the circuit is never kind of an easy one route fits all. Sometimes you're going to be putting festivals on a strategy that you can't actually submit to because you've been screened somewhere else. It's not always a bad thing. It's a lovely champagne problem to have. But, but just being aware of uh, any premiere clashes to begin with just means that you can kind of um, essentially keep an eye on it and not spend money on a festival where you're not eligible already. Next, we then kind of split it into um, territories. Um, but then also we break down the US states because a lot of the strategies that we create, and in fact, any one circuit journey generally tends to be in the US just because it's so vast. And also there are so many genre specific festivals there and not necessarily just genre, but, you know, female focused festivals, um, you know, documentary specific and so on. Um, so then we also kind of include the European parts too. Now, if we have a particular client, which is, little bit more locale so for example we have a Canadian client uh, we would then add an extra color in for all the different kind of areas of Canada to make sure that the, those premier statuses aren't conflicting with each other but also so we know that we've tapped into everywhere that the client would like to screen in home territory. Website for the festival I think that's one of the most important things you can do because some festivals have similar names um, and it's generally the interchangeable independent or international um, just making sure that the festival you're wanting to submit to is the one that you're looking at and making sure that that's correct. Then this column here with under the pin is the categories. Now, every festival will have a different category depending on what they're asking for or if they have any particular uh, focuses that year. But again, just keeps you kind of in check about which one you are submitting to. Um, sometimes if you have a film that perhaps is um, a cross genre, so you might have an LGBTQ sci-fi film, which we've had before. Um, it will vary on the festival. So it might be that you look at it and they don't have an LGBTQ category, but they have a sci-fi. So of course you go for a sci-fi or vice versa. 
Um, if in doubt, and I will kind of stress this, um, any decent legitimate festival, if you submit to a category and they think it should sit into another one, they will move it. What you shouldn't do is submit to more than one category because it's just not standard process. When you're submitting to a festival, you pay one submission fee and it's going to the category that you'd like it to. If they think it fits somewhere else, they will move it. Um, so that's kind of a handy tip. Um, also kind of marking where you submitted, uh, which submission platform, did you do it online, was it an email? But then also this I think is a really important column underneath the spanner. So the way that we kind of list it is a previous submission. So if a client comes to us and it was a previous submission, it just means that we know that any correspondence might go to them, uh, but also they would have to let us know if it got selected or non-selected. Submitted, just keeping it up to date, that you have submitted, especially if you're working in a team, it means that nobody's spending more money than they need to and having duplicates. Requested, if a festival has requested the film, so therefore you haven't paid anything, it just means that they've reached out to you. If it's open, um, the other uh, drop down menu we have is not open, hold, um, and also creatives cover, which is you know more for us because we're, we're working with clients uh, one on one. Um, but this kind of this, this goes on a lot further, this particular um, strategy document. But you don't have to do anything as in depth as this. I think the main thing for us is that you just keep an uh, uh, just keep a uh, track of where you submitted um, and when and when that festival takes place, just so you can understand how things fall with each other. Um, I will recommend Airtable. We're not paid by them, but we use them a lot and it's free. Um, if you want to pay a bit extra, you can have all the different color coding on, on it like this, but you can create whatever document you want in there. It's quite freestyle. Um, and it means that you can uh, put things in date order of deadline, or you can put them in order of when the festivals take place. You can put the festivals into alphabetical order if you're particularly looking for one festival and you can't find it. So it's very, very intuitive. And I do recommend you do that. So the next thing is about the submission materials that festivals will need. So when you get to the point of getting your film ready to go in, onto the festival circuit, you're going to encounter a submission platform at any given point because that's what a lot of festivals do to receive their submissions. Um, but I want to go through some of the bits that um, filmmakers can sometimes get a little bit stuck on, or I always feel that they can really um, hone in on and, and make a lot stronger. And the first thing is log line. So after, because we've been doing this so long, we kind of have got a bit of a, sh a shorthand of what festivals are expecting. And log line generally tends to be no more than 25 words. And it is one sentence. It's a log line. It's a sentence that kind of sums up the story and is brief and to the point, and it doesn't reveal too much. Now, 25 words isn't a goal, a bit like speeding. Um, it's, it's a limit, but you don't have to hit it. If you go under, it's absolutely fine. Handy tip, don't start it with, this is a short film about, because you waste words. It shows a naivety and you want to show off the strength of your film. Um, you need to hit the ground running, talk about plot, talk about story, because that's what the log line is for. Um, now, if any of you are working in pitching documents, it does take a time to kind of refine this, but just work on it because sometimes, and I will show you later, sometimes a printed program only has space for a log line. Um, and the other thing I will say is sometimes a festival will reduce how long that log line can be. So for example, Kerry International Film Festival, it's 19 words. So that's why we always say to people have something short and pithy to begin with because if you need to trim it more it's a lot easier than trying to trim down a massive paragraph um so as an example uh, we've got two films uh, both of which um, have uh, not long finished with us they had very fruitful circuit journeys but just to go through the top one so adnan an imaginative 10 year old syrian refugee boy must use all his creativity to break through his mother's PTSD or risk losing her forever. So we understand who the character is, what their plight is and their situation. And it's one sentence. It, it has a lot of texture to it and it's very, very thorough. So 1-800-D-Direct, very different. This is a comedy, live action. Um, while working a mundane job selling dishwashers in 1960s Manhattan, Joyce and Francis hatch a secret business to give every woman the D they really want. So again, it sets the scene. It tells us it's a period piece. 
Um, it tells us uh, location wise is in Manhattan uh, and also that it's very tongue in cheek. So again, just in that short, uh, snappy log line, we understand everything. And also the thing to think about is this is what's going to be read by audience members. So, you know, you're kind of going through the process of the first gatekeeper is, you know, making the film. Second gatekeeper is getting the film selected. And then the, the kind of third and final boss, as it were, is the audience. And you want them to flick through a program, read the synopsis and go, that sounds really interesting. I want to watch that which is why that log line is really, really important. So moving from a log line to a brief synopsis. So again, we've kind of established no more than 40 words. Now, if your log line is strong enough, you can just use it again, it's absolutely fine. What we would recommend is perhaps peckering it with a little bit more context, um, but just still keeping it to a couple of sentences and still not revealing too much. I think the main thing that we always stress is that this is for people to entice people to come and watch the film. It's not about telling them everything about the film so they come see it. It's enticing them so they want to come see it and then they find out about the film. Um, again, I've just used as an example, Adnan again and 1-800-D Direct. So Adnan's uh, synopsis was, 10 year old Adnan has fled Syria with his mother after their family were killed and their neighborhood destroyed. Now settled in the UK, he must use all his creativity to break through her PTSD or risk losing her forever. So again, it's a little expansion on the log line. So it's given us the age of Adnan. It's also given his locale, uh, location in terms of he's fled one place and come to another. And it's a little bit more about um, his plight, just expanding on that again. It's not too wordy. It's, it's kind of still brief, but it tells everything without ruining or describing every single plot point of the story. So for 1-800-D Direct, um, Joyce and Francis work at 1-800-D Direct the latest and greatest dishwasher sales company in 1960s Manhattan. But when a customer is given the wrong data, the woman must navigate her out of a life or death situation. So again, just kind of expand a little bit more on the scenario. It's a workplace comedy and also very tongue in cheek. So again, really kind of hones in. You can see how they've been fleshed out from the log line, but they've not gone too overboard and explained absolutely everything. Now, the reason I wanted to show you some examples is because sometimes a festival, when they have a printed program, right? So I'm just going to show you two examples. So this is a Bouchon International Fantastic Festival. It's quite a chunky beast. There's a reason for that is because every film gets its own page and they have the original language, but then they have the English translation below. And they also have director's uh, headshot as well as a short bio so again sometimes you get a lot of space but not everyone does that because i'm now going to show you mammoth lakes which is where i was a few weeks back it's a tiny program <laughs> to begin with but also you sometimes get just a very very brief log line so you get an image log line title but depending on the layout of the program sometimes you don't get a lot of space. So that's why you need to make sure that your log line synopses are tight because what you don't want to do is someone go, I can't fit that in. I'm going to have to cut someone else's uh, log line for them. Sometimes a festival will do it and it's not great. So that's why it's always kind of good to do it up front. So this is Athens International, which is in Ohio, Academy Affiliated Festival. So they've got a very thin kind of like paper um, they always do a paper one, so it's quite nice. But what that means is they can fit a lot more text in, but it is very, very brief. It is just really, really short kind of sections. So again, it's just always good to really like think how that will look in a program. So again, I just mentioned bios. We generally say 40 words um, and we realize that's quite short, but it needs to be kind of kept to your work, uh, work life really. Um, so just trying to kind of really hone in on, you know, perhaps you're a documentarian or you're an animator or, you know, you're a student production um, or anything that just kind of hones in on you and your kind of creativity skills. Um, we've kind of used a cross section here, but we wanted to do this just because each of them have very different things to highlight. So with cameras, it's about, you know, he's known as an actor, but he's now kind of moving into directing. So we, look, we looked after his um, directorial debut, which is Grab My Hand, A Letter to My Dad. 
and he's now subsequently made several films after that but it's that's for that particular point in time mentioning that was just a nice little flair because obviously it just means that anyone who's reading his bio will go this is his debut film for lane she's done something quite um cunning which is actually put a website link so again, if you're short of space and you just want to be able to give something that someone can then go and find out further information, a website link is always good. Um, for Emma, her kind of background is as a photographer. So she wants to kind of highlight she was a photographer before, which now she's kind of transgressed and moved into aesthetic uh, form of filmmaking. Um, so again, just something that really hones in on your strengths and your qualities, but also your experience up to that point. It doesn't always get used in a programme um, but also it can be used as perhaps notes for um, anyone who's doing a Q&A with you for your blog. So again, just making sure that it's up to date and it's short and pithy and really kind of like sells you. So the next thing is about stills. So we recommend between six to eight uh, strong stills from film. No festival ever needs behind the scenes stills. So if I take Film Freeway, you get the opportunity to upload nine stills. Those nine stills, if you upload nine, you might not upload and fill them all in, but if you upload any images there, they all should be narrative stills, stills from your film. Um, and for us, we it's just a personal thing. We like to put them in order the way that they happen. So it's just a little bit of a journey. But also I always kind of say to people, don't shy away from putting reveal shots in there because this is for someone to look at your film to consider it. This is not an audience member. So, for example, we had a short film where somebody gets stabbed and we wanted to show um, how the filmmakers had handled that, that it didn't look naff, it didn't look cheap, it actually looked very, very realistic. So, of course, we kind of put that as one of those shots in there. But they should be images that sell your film. They are your silent salesperson. They are something for somebody to look at and go, that's really intriguing, I need to know more. So we've just got a few selections here um, so the one at the top left, which is uh, the male and female kind of touching hands. Again, it's very striking because it's a peculiar scenario. You know, we don't know if that person's dead. We don't know why she's got a tag on her arm. Uh, one's awake, one's asleep. What's going on? But what it does do is as an audience, it draws your eyes to it and really seeks your attention, which means that when you're flicking through a programme, you'll then go, that looks interesting. You'll read the synopsis. And of course, you're going to have worked on your synopsis. That's really strong. And it's going to make people go, I want to see that film. So it's kind of a knock on effect. So that's why all these things in their individual states are just uh, are important. But actually, collectively, they work together really, really well. Um, just a quick note about black and white films or any shots that you use at nighttime is just to be very, very cautious about how dark they come across. The bottom right here, which is Roger the Rat, one of our uh, clients, experimental South African film. Um, it's quite dark and sometimes on when we do this kind of talk on uh, some screen, sometimes it will look really light, sometimes it'll look very dark. It is on the line just because it is a very dark film. So just be very hyper aware. I'm just going to go back to, where's the film? If I just show you, um, okay, this is from the Taiwan International Documentary Festival. So again, it's a, it's a paper one. You generally tend to get kind of either um, monotone or monochromatic uh, printing on paper. Uh, this one has kind of bolts of color in it, but for the majority of it, it is black and white images. So again, just being aware that sometimes you're gonna have no control over how your image is presented. So what you need to be aware of is making your images as malleable as you can. So again, if you had a very nighttime shot in this, like a really dark one, it might not come across really, really well. So perhaps just thinking about that as well. Um, not every festival prints black and white, but it's, it's just something to be a bit aware of. I'm just gonna pick one that maybe, but this is, I would say is on the line. It's still, you can still view it, but it is kind of a dog in a street, but because you know the pavement and the, the road is quite dark. So it means that really the only light that pops is, is the skyline. Uh, which is okay, but if that was any darker, you know, you'd lose all of the kind of um, image that you want to translate. But still is really important. Um, what we generally tend to do is have five, uh, six to eight fill, uh, stills from the filmmaker, but then we choose what we call hero shots. So three stills that we go, they're the ones that we give the film festivals because they scream the loudest about the story or they're intriguing or they're just really eye-catching. 
um, it also means that you get a little bit of a branding. So I'm pretty sure that all of you who have uh, perhaps seen a short film at a festival have then begun to see that stain still. And you can kind of instantly recognize and go, yeah, I've seen that film because of the image. So that's the best way to think of it as well. So when it comes to posters, um, it's something that is not necessarily required for submissions. It's the same as a trailer. It's not something that a festival won't consider your film if you don't have them, because a lot of films don't have them. Um, but it's something that's realistically more for you as the individual creative to utilize. I would say the only difference that we've seen in the past two years is where festivals had gone online on a virtual capacity. And depending on what uh, VOD platform they were utilizing, um, sometimes the poster made sense because it was, it was made for a poster rather than a still. Um, but in your average festival that kind of plays at cinema and kind of, you know, back in person, posters are not necessarily a, a kind of a must. Um, they are more so for you. So the best thing to do is to, if you want to create a poster, create one, make sure you've got, excuse me, make sure you've got space on it. Um, and that's because obviously when you get those laurels, you want to use it as a bit of a passport to show where the film's been. Um, but realistically, just kind of making sure that it, it actually is a continuation of your film, that it actually has the same theme. Sometimes we get a poster and it's because somebody's wanted to do something really, really different. It doesn't quite correspond with the film, which means that when somebody looks at the poster, they expect something from the film. It doesn't quite deliver. Um, the, the selection that we have here, I would say they are all perfect shots from the film. It uh, really just kind of says what it is. You know, so we've got The Out uh, by Harry Brandrick, which is a great film, and it is about a father and him the first night looking after his daughter after he's come out of prison. So again, that kind of fully encapsulates that moment. The second one, Queen of the Desert by Marianne Rotondi, is a perfect film about perceived notions and um, racism. So again, you know, you've kind of got a white male uh, lorry driver with a young black woman with a Confederate flag in the cab. So again, perfect encapsulation. Lines slightly different. It's a poetry film, um, which is animated. So again, these images that are here are part of the animation. Uh, and it is a black and white animation too. And Sia Kakare, which is a beautiful debut documentary from Mike Beach, um, is a South Korean narrative about um, a woman who's gone back to her family home after her mother dies. So again, you've kind of got her in the fields where her mother would work. And again, very simplistic, but it just encapsulates the story. So I would say with posters, they're not a must, but if you're going to do them, make sure that you are aware of what you're using them for and how you're going to utilize them going forward. Headshots, clue is in the name, should be of your head. Um, we get lots of images of people on their holiday in bikinis and swim trunks, and it's really not ideal for professional uh, headshots. It just needs to be a clear, clean picture of yourself, uh, kind of ideally, uh, shoulders up, um, but it could be anything that just shows off your face clearly. That's the main thing. Everyone pretty much has a smartphone now, so you could just stand in front of a black, uh, a blank background or just use portrait mode, just something that just shows you off. And the reason I say that, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes a festival will actually um, put the bios in the program. And of course, the reason they do that is because if you are physically there, it means that the audience members and other industry professionals can come up and notice who you are and actually kind of come and talk to you about the film. Um, and they also do it for shorts for this particular festival as well. So you get still from the film and a headshot, still from the film, headshot. And that's quite a dark headshot, but it is a picture of his head. So, you know, it's, it's always bodes well to kind of make an effort with that one. Um, if you are not so keen, on having your face shown and we have had some clients like that we we understand that it's not necessarily everyone's kind of goal to have their face out there but you will have to at some point because of festival passes um doing q and a's and so on so maybe just kind of make sure that you've taken a picture that you're comfortable with that's all i kind of say so next we're going to talk about selection so when you get a festival that says yes we really like your film um they're going to then send you lots of extra requirements. So you have the first deadline, which is to submit, put your hat in the ring, and then you're gonna get another deadline for when they need things delivered. Um, so be prepared with your materials from day one. I cannot stress that enough. 
especially this time of year as well, where there are a lot of final deadlines coming up. If you are submitting to a final deadline, you are going to hear sooner than somebody who submitted maybe four months ago because they've they've been waiting and you're submitting closer to the, the kind of final submission stage. So just make sure that you have everything. Um, make sure you read the deadlines on your acceptance uh, emails, and that can be from delivery. So they might say, we are going to send you a separate email with how you need to deliver your film files. And then they will give you a deadline date. Um, but they may also mention an embargo date. And that's basically when a festival says, you cannot announce your involvement in our festival until we have, and we're doing it this date. So after that, you can mention it. Um, it's best to stick to that because you can piss a lot of people off with it. But also it goes in your favour because they're going to do a big announcement of all the films that have been selected or just kind of announcing their headliners, which means that you can then piggyback off socials and kind of share stuff and say, yeah, I'm also in this lineup. I've been shared here. Um, I've been selected here. Um, read exactly what the festival is asking for, which goes for both copy length. So I mentioned earlier, like Kerry International wanted 19. Uh, some festivals want 20 and so on. Read exactly what they want, because again, I cannot stress enough, if you don't send them the correct thing, they are going to amend it themselves. And I would rather you, as a creative, send something you're perfectly happy with, rather than kind of get a bit of a surprise when you read something and go, I didn't write that, and that's not what I wanted it to be. So again, just read everything. You've taken the time to submit to a festival that you really want to get selected for. So when they select the film, just do everything you can to get them what they need and the sooner the better because they will be so thankful for it in the industry we're known for delivering stuff literally as soon as we get the emails that's because that's our job but of course we realize filmmakers have day jobs they have childcare, they have families they have you know other jobs not in the industry or they're on set or on location whatever so we're not saying that you have to do it on the day that you get it but do not leave it till last minute um because that's just more room for error um, especially because if they might be asking for a particular film file, the sooner you send it to them, uh, the sooner they can point out if anything is incorrect. And that could be the incorrect uh, file rate, or it could be a small size, or it could be the wrong codec. But just don't leave it to the last minute. Um, but also just keep talking to the festival because they're going to be thrilled if you can attend perhaps, or if you can do any social media shout outs. The one thing that we always hear from festivals is the frustration that some filmmakers go quiet and it frustrates us because, you know, you've taken the time to kind of get the film out there and made. So now you kind of want to share the love and kind of, you know, tag the festival on whatever platform that you utilise. Um, but also they might be talking to you saying, oh, if you're attending, we'd love you to do this training uh, situation or, you know, we might be able to put on a dinner for you to meet other filmmakers all of these things are possible, but just keep talking to them. It's the best thing you can do. So on the flip side, I'm going to talk about non-selections. Uh, and it's part of our part of our company remit that we're trying to not say the word rejection. We're trying to say non-selection, um, just because rejection is, sounds quite harsh, but there is no pretty way of dressing it up. Um, so when it comes to rejection, there's going to be a platitude of reasons why your film wasn't selected, but they're not necessarily always going to be no or bad. Um, the thing to remember is that your film won't be for everyone. So no matter where you get selections, there's going to be people in the audience that either don't like your film or don't understand it, or perhaps are really nonplussed about it. But, you know, the whole beauty of short film programs is if you don't like something, you wait five, 10, 15 minutes and you see the next film. Um, but there's so many variables as to why it was turned down, but they're not necessarily all going to be bad. The one thing I can tell you now, whilst we've had a pandemic and at the beginning, very beginning, early days, um, numbers were down for submissions because people didn't know what to expect. Festivals were postponing because they didn't know how to kind of adapt. But as we kind of went through that, the submission numbers have increased for festivals because all those filmmakers that held off suddenly saw actually film festivals can still provide something. So even on an average non-pandemic year, submission numbers are through the roof. So festivals that used to get 500 submissions now get 5,000. Um, you know, festivals that were really small and niche to begin with suddenly have found their calling and have reached a wider audience, which means loads of filmmakers are just injecting it with more submissions. It's a lot cheaper to make film now than it was, which means that I'm not saying that every single film that somebody makes on their phone or, you know, on their VHS recorder or whatever is going to be great, 
what it means is that there's more opportunities for people to make film, which means they will then submit it to festivals. So those festivals having to sift through everything and kind of go, right, that's really not a, you know, that's not a plot, you know, that's, that doesn't kind of fit or that's a sketch and let's kind of sift through and go through the stages. So the submission numbers are always increasing, but the festivals are there to boost you as a filmmaker and a creative. They're not the be all and end all. So you can seek validation from them because it means you've reached a wider audience that you don't know, you've played the other side of the world, and that's fantastic. But if a festival turns you down, it's not the case that you're a bad filmmaker. And that's really hard for us to kind of hear filmmakers think. Um, And part of our job is a part-time therapist because we're constantly kind of having to reassure people like, your film's not bad, you're not a bad filmmaker. It literally is just a very, very oversaturated, tough market. So when you do get those selections, that's why we're really urging people to focus on them because you don't know when the next one's coming along, but also really savor that moment, really kind of go this film festival that I submitted my film to because I wanted them to select it, have selected it. So now it's like, okay, perfect relationship. Let's get something going. So then it's your opportunity to then really sing the praises of the festival. Let's say you go, you can then come back and go, oh my God, it's an amazing opportunity. I really want to stress the filmmakers they should submit here going forward. So it's about kind of flipping it. And a lot of our kind of role is trying to get people to really savour those selections. Um, And, you know, in a world where the last two years we've had to do a lot of things virtually, it's, it's been even easier to do that because you can take part in online uh networking sessions or online pitching forums or just kind of watch each other's films and talk to each other and that's probably more that you would do than if you were physically there um because a lot of these festivals are just kind of party driven and that's great but you know it looking to the industry side of things you know furthering your career conversations just focus on those selections you get because i cannot stress you enough it, it's so disheartening for us when we see filmmakers go, yeah, that's great, I got selected, but when's the next one? You're like, you have so many opportunities when a festival picks your film, especially because that time, you're not one of the non-selected people. So, you know, you should be really kind of going, this is amazing, I'm going to make the most of it. So just, we've got a few FYIs because we do get asked a lot of questions about these kind of um, areas. And I always think it's good to, really drill down and kind of help expand on some of them because they're they're not as simple and some are a little bit more complex so the first one is you have to know someone to get your film screened i cannot stress this enough i've been doing this job for 18 years if that were the case (laughs) it i it would be a different job and you know there are no guarantees on the festival circuit like just because we like something it doesn't mean that every program is going to like it they have an audience to fulfill their criteria and their tastes and their flavors. Um, And it's frustrating because at the same time, this is why it's complex. I'm not going to deny that there are festivals that do that. They're not necessarily, they're not necessarily decent and not necessarily always legit, but realistically every film programmer has to be able to stand by the decision of the films that they picked. And they may have a bit of a free pass in terms of, I really like this film and I really want you to kind of consider it for one of the headline slots or, you know, this filmmaker we worked with before, it's a really good audience pleaser, whatever, but it's not going to be an entire program of, I know all these people, that's why they're being selected. Um, It may seem like that. And it's, it's so easy for a filmmaker to fall back onto those kind of thoughts because it's easier than saying, my film just wasn't suited that time or, you know, or competition was tough or they only pick 10 films a year and mine wasn't one of them, Um, which kind of slightly bleeds into the next one, which are films not watched by the festivals. Now this kind of stems from people sitting on Vimeo and watching their analytics and even Vimeo themselves have come out and said that they're not exactly 100% true to form Uh, And it can be simple things like I do it where if somebody has made their film downloadable, I'm going to download it and watch it offline because I'm traveling a lot. I'm also I don't have great Internet in my home village, which means that I'll download it and then I can watch it offline without buffering. That doesn't count as a watch. Um, If I start watching something and then lose connection and I start watching it again and I forward it to the point where I left off, that doesn't count as a watch. Um, If you port your Vimeo uh, link into film freeway 
it doesn't necessarily count all the watches. So I think the main thing that, that filmmakers get frustrated frustrated about is because they're looking for those kind of uh, pings. They're looking for those kind of, they've watched it, so that means that festival has watched it, or they haven't. And it really frustrates film festivals because they get a lot of angry emails kind of accusing them of not watching the film, but they have. They've got the notes from their, their kind of screener. They've got them in front of them. They can kind of talk about the plot and why it wasn't suitable and everything else. And sometimes the film does make it through the rounds and it just doesn't get to that last final hurdle which it doesn't look good on a filmmaker if they're kind of accusing a festival. Um, now, again, the reason why this is slightly complex is I'm not going to deny there are festivals that don't watch the films, but again, I'm not going to name names because we only deal with decent, legitimate festivals. So again, part of it is that research you do as a filmmaker. Um, the other caveat to this is that a film may not necessarily be watched all the other way through in, in its entirety, because if a 25 minute film has been sent in, in and after five, seven, 10 minutes, the, pro, uh, the programmer just says, this really is not suitable for our crowd. They shouldn't have to watch the rest of it because if they're a festival who doesn't provide feedback, and again, that's a whole other conversation, um, it's not a good use of their time because they already know it's not gonna match their audience. So, you know, they've got other films to watch. Um, and again, that slightly irks some people, but at the same time, I, I kind of ask everyone, you know, if you had to sit through, you know, thousands of films and you just knew the audience that you're creating for, you're not really going to carry on watching a film if you know it's a no. Um, so just kind of bear that in mind as well. So EPKs, electronic press kits, um, they neither, they don't help a selection. They don't make a film get selected, much like a poster or a trailer. Um, they are an additional piece of information, which can be handy for some festivals. But I can honestly tell you out of the 18 years I've been doing this, there's probably about four or five festivals that ask for an EPK if there is one. And they generally tend to be of the higher echelon festivals, generally because they have a press uh, contingency that are waiting to review the short films. So an EPK realistically is all of the stuff that you've inputted onto a submission platform. So stills, log line, bios, headshots, um, synopses, um, perhaps with a director's statement included or some anecdotes of the shoot, but it's more something that a festival can give to the press who's covering the festival and it has all the information there that they may not actually have to speak to you, that there's something there that they can just you know, garner some quotes from the festival state uh, from the director's statement and a few stills from the film but it's it's not a tipping point a film isn't selected because of a really nice epk it's selected because it's a good film um this is also something that we have to really stress with cover letters because cover letters are a hangover from about 10 years ago uh with without a box where you know many moons ago we used to have to do submissions by hand so we had to print out a form fill it in by hand put a cover letter on it to say who we were, what the film was, because the festival would have to return the DVD or the VHS, that's how old I am, um, to kind of send it back. So it's kind of lingered on. Um, and now people kind of think, oh, if I, I've got to write a really personalised cover letter. I can tell you now, I probably know about, I can count on two hands, festival programmers that I know who will read a cover letter, but there are variables. They'll only read the cover letter if they're interested in the film and after they've watched the film. So again, they'll watch it and they'll be like, oh, I'm going to read the cover letter to see if there's anything in there, just anything out of interest that maybe isn't kind of made clear in the film, but it's not the deciding factor. It really is the film. I cannot stress that enough. So I, I always say to filmmakers, it neither hinders uh, nor helps your, your film get selected. So don't waste too much time on them because I'd rather you spend more time researching the festival, looking at the previous programmes to see if your film is suitable there. The next and last thing for one of our popular myths is if you contact the festival after you submit, it helps. The majority of the times it does the opposite. It really doesn't help at all. And the reason we say that is because we know a lot of festival programmers that perhaps it's a small team and um, they don't necessarily need a lot of filmmakers kind of constantly going, have you watched the film? Have you watched the film? Do you like it? Because sometimes it's early stage. Sometimes it's after the first deadline and they still have films to watch and they don't want to give anyone false hope. 
uh, but also sometimes they just don't have time. Um, festivals do prefer to do things the more traditional way, which is to get the films in, watch the films, and then send out the kind of selections or non-selections. Um, but also, just again, film festivals talk to each other. And you'd be surprised by how many festivals, uh, sorry, how many programmers actually screen for other festivals. So we've just come back from Tribeca where, you know, we know lots of other festivals of note that are screeners for them and vice versa. So if a filmmaker leaves a bad taste in someone's mouth, they do all talk, um, but only for good reason to kind of give a heads up that, you know, this, this person, you know, there have been some very aggressive um, communications between filmmakers that have been turned down. And I'd like to think that none of you watching would do that, but just, keep yourself in check because film festivals do talk to each other. Um, and on the flip side, they talk to each other, I recommend films. So it can work both ways. So just be a nice, pleasant person who's made a brilliant film and that will kind of get you far. So I just want to talk about a few other moments as well. Scam festivals, they do exist and they're never going to not stop existing. Uh, there's no regulatory body for film festivals. So it means that, um, Every, every festival does things differently. There's no one size fits all. There's no correct way of doing something. I'm pretty sure that festivals will look at other festivals and go, I wouldn't do that, but there's not necessarily a kind of, you know, law abiding correct way, one set of rules fits all, um, which means that festivals can exist purely just to take money. Uh, and they will be, sometimes there will be a very kind of reasonable amount, kind of, you know, 15, 20 bucks and that's it. The easiest thing I can recommend is to check their online footprint um, and look at their social presence, look at any reviews. Uh, don't base it just on reviews because um, people can do them very easily, but just look at their previous program. Um, do they have the previous program on their website? Um, look at the images. Are they real venues? Um, are there any filmmakers that have played there before? that you can perhaps reach out to. If something doesn't feel right, walk away. There is no one holding a gun to your head saying you have to spend money here. My rule of thumb is that you should only be spending money on festivals that you'd be happy to be selected for because that is a mantra that I want everyone to go by because there are so many filmmakers that scatter gun submissions and then suddenly kind of get selection and go, oh, I don't think I want to be screened there anymore. You spent money there. You know, you should be thinking about this before you spend it. Um, on the other side of things, you will get phishing emails. Um, so our rule of thumb, and I know that some people disagree, but our rule of thumb, if a festival is reaching out to you for your film in particular, because they've seen it somewhere else or they've been recommended it, that should be a fee waiver, 100% discount. If they are reaching out with the name of your film and the name of you, or perhaps a name of the festival you screened at recently, um, and they're offering just a discount code, just be cautious. I'm not saying that everyone, I'm not tying everyone with the same brush, but more than often they are a phishing email. We look after an awful lot of films. So we're handling at the moment about 260 films, 270 films. And when we get an email from one festival that kind of says, hey, we've heard about your film, we'd love to consider it here. Here's a 20% discount code. And it's off their final deadline which is going to make it 50 bucks still. When we get suddenly a hundred of those emails all saying the same thing, it doesn't ring right. So again, it's easy for us because we're in that situation where we can see them a mile off. But when you're an individual filmmaker doing it by yourself, of course, it's going to feel personalized. It's going to feel bespoke. Just check. Because knowing the name of your film and of you is designed to pull you in. So again, I would just look at their digital footprint, email them back and just say, if, you know, classic, they would say, we've seen your film at a festival recently, email them back, say, where did you see my film? I'd love to know what you thought of it. Because if they are really interested in your film, they will answer every question you have. If they don't respond, it's not worth it. Remember, again, you don't have to do it. It's just somebody reaching out. I will say, as soon as you mention that you've made a film, you'll get DMs on Instagram, on Twitter, on Vimeo, on Facebook, on emails. Every, they, they will come at you thick and fast. But generally, they are festivals that are just looking to bolster content or just bolster submission fees. So just be a little bit more sniffy with your film. Like, it's your film. It's your baby. So just be very, very cautious of where it screens. Um, and then not all festivals are bad. Um, 
some festivals may be very young they don't have a budget i mentioned earlier about how uh, submission platforms take a cut for every uh, film that they receive again that's why some festivals will say we'll give you a waiver but you have to submit on our own website because whilst they are giving it to you 100 percent free they are still having to pay a commission to the platform to to kind of have it sent in that way so again the fee waiver may not be possible um, but just have an open dialogue with the festival. Like, again, as I say, if, if they're interested, they should be willing to answer any questions. Now I'm going to talk about festivals themselves. So once you've been selected and you uh, have decided to go to the festival, understand how they're taking place. Cannot stress that enough. Um, as we are still in a stage where festivals are being hybrid or still online or all in person, um, some people kind of just fall into that habit of thinking, oh, they're always going to have something online, so I'll do the online part. And when it gets to it, the festival's like, no, 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 we're actually happening in person. So you, know, you have to be physically present for these things. So understand how they're taking place. Any good festival will be telling you that as soon as they send you the selection. They're going to be saying, hey, we're going to be taking, uh, you know, we're going to be taking place in person for this week and the following week online. You know, or they might kind of say, look, we're actually doing it all online this year. We'd love to have you here. Um, be prepared to talk about your film and enjoy it. Um, I know filmmakers don't necessarily always like re-watching their film, but you have to understand that your audience and your festivals are coming to it at a later point than you. So whilst you, you might be sick and tired of it, like people are seeing it fresh and they're seeing it and they're being excited by it or interested or intrigued by it. So just understand like how you can compartmentalize that, kind of put that aside and go, actually, this person's really interested in my film. I'm going to really enjoy talking to them. Um, and the other thing as well is just to see other filmmakers work at the festival. It's quite common for some filmmakers to go to a festival, watch their own film, and that's it. You are curated around other films to make a block. And what you'll often find is if you have a, a fruitful journey, with some of those films, you'll follow each other around at festivals and you might be screened in the same block. Happens a lot with sci-fi, uh, horror and comedy. So if you've got one of those, you will end up kind of seeing a festival buddy. Um, but just see how you've been curated and it might be different for every festival, but it might be by theme, it might be by runtime, it might be by genre, but this is how you're connected and it is part of your community to kind of lean into. Again, you're not going to like everything, but it's a good experience to be able to kind of say to people like, oh, your film screening, when's your screening? Right, because mine's screening here, like, oh, yeah, I'd love you to see my film. So the other thing as well is to drum up interest in the lead up to your festival appearances, not last minute. So when you've been selected, the festival will, you will know, uh, even before you've been selected, when the festival is due to take place. So it means that you can drum up interest in the lead up to it, because if you know when the festival dates are, you can begin to kind of drip feed that into your socials. Or if you have a newsletter or a website, you can kind of begin to kind of feed that in. But then also, if you um, have like a bit of a hook in your film, it might be that the festival in question has a press list that you can utilise. Um, so, for example, Newport Beach or um, what was the other one we went to? Austin Film Festival. You know, they have a really big long list of press and some of them might not be relevant to you. But if you take something like Newport Beach, they kind of cover a very wide variety of films such as kind of uh, films about food, films about extreme sports. So let's say you have a film about dirt biking. If you then got that press list, you'd see that there'll be a section for like extreme sports or sports kind of contacts. And that might be bloggers, it might be kind of printed press, it might be websites and so on. So you can then do the work because you can say, hey, I'm screening my film here and I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, and it's easier to do that in the lead up rather than last minute because a lot of these places pre-schedule content um, and they are working to the festival deadlines too um, it doesn't always have to be so kind of um, you know in depth as that just knowing when you're screening um, if you're attending social media is easy it's there for you to kind of like take a selfie in front of the step and repeat or wearing your badge um, and and or just taking a picture of the of the audience and saying look I've got my first screening for this film and now I'm here it's, it's so easy to visually tell that story without having to do loads of copy with it. Um, I would recommend kind of looking at our social media because we try and um, mix it up with where we are physically um, kind of present at festivals, but then also the selections that we've got, 
or the new filmmakers that we've taken on. So it's always a constant stream of always telling you something, which is, hey, we're here, or hey, we've just signed up this film, or hey, we've got a selection there. And you can kind of do the same because you might be working on your next project, but it means that you can flip between the two. Um, and I know that some people don't necessarily like social media, but if it's if you're doing it a way that you enjoy or that benefits you, then it's less stressful, I would say. Uh, and I say that as someone who used to run a company of one and now there's more of us. So, you know, it's a lot, lot easier to talk about things when things are happening. So what to expect and prep for at festivals. So you do not have to be selected to attend a festival. And I always like to remind people of this. Um, I would encourage, if physically able to, to attend a festival you were not selected for, because if anything, you are still a filmmaker. You can stop being a filmmaker, but you will never stop being an audience member. And you are part of this community, whether you are behind the camera, in front of the camera, or sitting in the audience. So attend a festival because you don't have to be invited to network. Like a, any opportunity to kind of go and see an audience in one space or go for a drink at the bar afterwards, that's a networking opportunity. It doesn't have to be dressed up as this is a networking event. You're there to talk to like-minded people. And it might be audience members that you just want to gauge, oh, did you enjoy the films? Which one was your favourite? Or it might be that you are a filmmaker who attended and that you kind of go, oh, actually, yeah, I, I was the writer on that film. And somebody else might go, oh, I was a producer on the other short. I'd love to talk to you about your next project. So you don't have to physically be welcomed into that kind of you know, selection. You can still attend. It's still an opportunity. One of the things that a lot of festivals do is they may offer you a pass even though you weren't selected. And that's just a sign of respect because they want to say thank you for choosing our festival to submit your film to and spend your submission fees on. And I went to Mammoth Lakes a few weeks ago and I met three filmmakers who took them up on that opportunity. And they were so thrilled they did it. Because for them, they were like, yeah, we were a bit like, oh, bummer, we didn't get in. But actually, they thought, well, we've got the time free. And you know what? It'd be nice just to go and see what did get selected. And they had a whale of time. And there were networking events. And there was industry panels. And they could go, even though they weren't selected. So just really think about kind of perhaps not being too pissed off and use it as an opportunity. Um, you won't enjoy all the films. That's just a given. Like you are going to watch stuff that you go, why the heck did they pick that? But they know their audience well. Um, we don't like everything that we go to. But again, that's because we're looking after a vast number of uh, films that we're thinking, oh, we think ours would have been better there and so on. You're never going to shake that off, but you're just there to watch the films and experience it. And again, you know, you wait a couple of minutes and you find something you do like. Um, do share your stories and experiences. If you went to a festival that you had an amazing time at, tell people and also tell the festival because they will massively appreciate it if you had a bad time same thing because people will need to kind of know these things we always say like you'll never meet anyone more honest than a filmmaker because they will tell you if they had an amazing time they will tell you if they had a shit time um but just understand that every audience is different and every festival is different and every festival has different prestige it has different opportunities to give you why we encourage people going to as many festivals as they can is so they can understand that. So they can kind of go, oh, I went to Phoenix Film Festival and it was great. But then I went to Poppy Jasper Film Festival and they did something a little bit more personal, which I really liked, but I preferred this at that festival. So you end up kind of, you know, no festival is going to be absolutely perfect. But what you'll find is you kind of begin to glean a, a few bits where you go, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to really remember the opportunity that I had here or actually... I'd never thought of going to that location before, but the film festival took me there. And now I've, I've got those memories forever. And that's kind of part of the joy of our job because we're, we're going to so many festivals that we can kind of feed back to a filmmaker. And we might say to a filmmaker, look, this festival isn't an industry festival. Like don't go there expecting to meet industry professionals. But if you want to go somewhere you've never been before and have a fun time and go to some really, really exciting different parties, go for it. Or we might say, this is a festival that is industry. You have to go there because it is such an amazing opportunity. You don't want to miss out. So again, every festival is different. And that is the beauty of the circuit. For every you know, if film festival that's out there that's bad, there are like 20 amazing ones. And every individual opportunity that you have is going to be so unique because 
you might go to a festival thinking this is going to be nothing special and it be the best opportunity you've had and just really exciting and you might meet someone that you're forever friends with or you work with um I just love the opportunities that film festivals provide and that is part of the joy of working with so many filmmakers that we can encourage them and say like try it go there you know if time and budget and opportunities lead you there try it because you just never know um but also you're kind of helping to feed this kind of um the good part of the community which is you know you're helping with your submission fees to help run a festival that perhaps doesn't have the funding yet but then as that festival grows you'll always remember them so whenever you've got new content to submit you're always going to go back to that festival the festival's going to appreciate that you're an alumni so they might be able to offer you like discount or you know like indie shorts and heartland if you're alumni you you never pay a fee ever again to submit you know they want to kind of nurture that that kind of emerging talent so it's super exciting you can tell i've just started going back to festivals in person because i'm really gushing so it's been a long time um but does anyone have any questions well i'll, I'll, I'll kick off with, with a few observations what we do at green is is the business of crowdfunding and the more projects we do and the more things that come through the more focused the more we realize that the focus is about pitching and it's about being able to make people just get to your film like that in in a whole bunch of different contexts depending on the, the media the medium with with which you're communicating um and the stage you're at and what i took away from your excellent presentation katie was a lot of things like that so to start with the um the bit you did earlier on, which was about, you know, the stills you submit and the log line and, and the tag kind of thing. And one of the things we very often have to persuade people to do, or because it's not imminent, immediately obvious, when you're making a crowdfunding pitch video, you don't just trot out the plot. Never do it, never do it. Because the purpose of your, your crowdfunding video is to invoke curiosity and it's to get people wanting more and to know about it more and to, to engage, which, you know, literally... Trot, trotting out, you know, your, your, your principal plot points never, never really works. Now, I was looking at the materials you put together for for Aman and for the um, dish. Oh, one eight hundred D direct. Oh, eight one hundred D direct. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was in in perfect in in miniature because both of those you you had the taglines, which was, you know, Aman's tagline finishes with risk losing her forever. Mm. The other film, the women must navigate her out of a life or death situation, and in both of those, uh, both both of those, they're accompanied by images, and you've got you know human faces, human figures that you can see, and they're also looking from from the right of the frame to the left of the frame, which creates you know it's imbalanced, it's uh, creates tension, it's it's looking backwards rather than looking forwards, and I was I was. I don't know whether that's something you helped or with, or whether that's something the, the creatives themselves came up with, but I thought to me those were both perfect little miniatures of how you're going to pitch your film in those 25 words and, and with that single image. So I thought that was great. Yeah. It's exactly it, that. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, what happens is when, when we ask for the stills, they come in and then Ian and I will do the hero shot. So we'll pick the three. And generally the way that we're looking at it is uh, what image are we going to put on the website that's going to kind of capture people and really capture the tone? Like, you know, when people look at it and see the title, it's going to make sense. But then also that it's readable to the eye because sometimes they can be a little, either a little bit too busy or it's too much yeah. of a wide shot or yeah. it's too dark. Too but dark what, is the what, classic, yep. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, what was interesting is that we will pick the ones for the festival use and the website and we'll always have the odd filmmaker go, oh, why have you picked that one? Like, we've always picked this one. And we go, you've picked it because you know the film. You know that pivotal moment that that is, is talking about. For an audience member, they need something that is readable and enticing, not necessarily the reaction to something that happens in the film. So sometimes we have to explain the choices that we make, but it's always for the benefit of the film. It's always with a few that if somebody sees this image, they're going to want to know more. Um, and there's images out on the internet that when we watch stuff, um, when we're watching a film, 
both Ian and I will kind of look at a shot and we'll be like, that's a hero. That's a hero shot. And it's literally in the moving film. And we'll just be like, that's the hero shot. That's the hero shot, you know? So I think it's important to kind of think of your film as, well, think of your still as an extension of your film, but not as, um, you've got to look at it from somebody who hasn't watched the film at all. Because, you know, some, some images that we get, they're just very pedestrian. Like they, they, they're kind of, yeah, they, they just don't scream anything. They just kind of, they're just like, nah, you know, they don't really say anything. Whereas we're often saying to people, no, your stills do not tell how emotional your story is or how gripping it is. Or, you know, you've picked a, a still from your genre film that does, doesn't evoke any genre. You know, there's got to be something that kind of, underpins what it's about completely completely and you know objectivity is is quite difficult with filmmakers because you know you've lived and eaten and breathed this project for you know a couple of years probably uh so you don't necessarily have a fresh pair of eyes doing on it and you should be working with Katie obviously but even if you're not perhaps perhaps get somebody who's not so immersed in the film and and show him some seals and say, you know, which, which one of these do you fancy? Just to get that little bit of outsider ob- objectivity. Um, it's it's something very useful because you can get a little too close to your material right there. This is from Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, so an issue that I and many others have faced, typically in festivals that are short film focused and claim to favour low budget films, the winners always seem to have a massive leg up compared with micro budgeted self-finance project. I'm looking at you, BFI. Oh, in fact, it's it's there. Yeah, okay, let's carry on. <laughs> These winners have much bigger budgets and are backfunded by the organisations like the BFI, have known actors. How on earth do we compete with that and get noticed? Obviously, there are projects that defy the odds because of their story, but what they've achieved with nothing but the chances are slim. Great question. It's interesting because I would say that I haven't seen any BFI funded projects that would go that would be classed as a low budget film. No. Um, definition. I, yeah, I, I will say, as I mentioned earlier, it, def- it depends on what the festival is defining as low budget, because for Cardiff Mini Film Festival, they've got a low budget, which is anything under three grand and a high budget, anything over five or uh, three. So over three. So three is the threshold. But then if you take something like Independent Film Fest in Germany, Independent Film Fest days in Germany, their low budget is for a feature less than 250 euros per minute. Um, so it has to work out like, you know, overall how much it's spent. Um, I think, I think there's several parts to the observation and I agree. I think some festivals do favor films that have no names in, not necessarily all bad. I mean, you know, a film has still got to be good um, but at the same time, there's so many film festivals out there that um, it might be a case of just shifting focus because we've had low budget films uh, with us and uh, they've gone on to do exceptionally brilliant things. We've not necessarily called them low budget. That's the thing, because it depends on the festival. So, you know, we took on a film that cost 500 quid to make and it had its world premiere at Palm Springs a few years back. Um but for Palm Springs, it didn't have to be low budget. And they didn't they didn't request any information about the budget. But for um, we probably submitted it to Independent Film Fest Days because it is a low budget film. Um, so I think it's dependent on the festivals that you're looking at and also, you know, the criteria that they're specifying. It's it's rare for a festival to request information about the budget unless it is of importance generally is for features, I will say, because they they might have a a category for low budget feature, it's got to be under 250K, um, in which case you're going to have to tell them like, how much did you spend? But I I would say this is is our slight frustration because if film, and I'm not saying that you're doing this, Gavin, I'm just saying this as a generalisation. We know it's really hard as a filmmaker when you're trying to submit to festivals that you know are of a certain quality and of a certain prestige and that you get knocked back from them. What you will generally find is those festivals are oversubscribed because everyone is submitting there. Um, And you get that in the UK. Just if we isolate the UK by itself, we have very few festivals actually in the entire UK. What we do have is we've got a lot of festivals that are of a certain higher caliber that everyone submits to in the UK, including international. 
So somewhere like Encounters, London Short Film Festival, Leeds, Edinburgh, Glasgow Short, Aesthetica, Norwich, you know, Bolton, Manchester, they're all festivals that get a lot of content submitted within the UK, which is everyone. And then also kind of international too. And they don't always have an international category. So it means that everyone's put into the same pot. Um, and it's frustrating for us because if you get knocked back from multiple festivals like that, um, it's not always because your film's bad, but it's hard because if you've been knocked back and then you're just like, oh, I keep seeing those same films over and over again. Honestly, like the circuit is so big, you will find an audience. It just might not necessarily be the audience that's A, on your doorstep or B, that you expected. And I think that's that's why for us, it's really important to kind of stress that you're a filmmaker to begin with, you've made a film. The festival circuit is partly there to validate you and to kind of give you that confidence but prove that your narrative can play further afield. You know, our goal is always to, first of all, get a film seen by an audience, but also to try and see how far we can get that audience to be. Because if we can get an Irish filmmaker's work seen in New Zealand, that's amazing because it means their story translates and it means that they were selected out of the hundreds and thousands of films to be curated in that block. But then vice versa, if we have an American filmmaker and majority of American filmmakers don't know anything outside of the US and Canada. So if we get them a screening in Cork International, you know, for them, they go, wow, OK, my film works outside of the US. Didn't know that. So I kind of would say that it, it's dependent on where you're looking to the circuit, because if it's a kind of doorstep, like on your doorstep, insular, sometimes it can be frustrating more so than it needs to be, because you're always going to get rejection on home turf. That That's just the way that the cookie crumbles, not because your film's bad, but because everyone is, is vying for those slots. Um, and they've got an audience that they know they need to entertain with particular content. So I would say, don't lose hope. Please, please look further afield. There will be an audience for you. Absolutely correct. And I mean, you know, I it's, it's a bugbear of mine, but the... BFI London Film Festival. There you've got it. In four words, it encapsulates whose projects are going to be. I will say we have had BFI selections. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, it, it does seem to be, you know, a bit of a Willy Wonka golden ticket if you've been on one of those schemes for that particular festival. No, I was just going to say that there's kind of two elements I wanted to raise because for the last um, two years, obviously, the pandemic has kind of skewed the programme quite a lot. So they actually went from generally screening about 60 odd films to 30. So they really cut it down and they didn't do their regular strands. That they normally do like Dare, Thrill and everything else. So um, there's that. But then also, and I don't know how they're going to, I don't know if they're going to go back to their usual type of programming. So. Um, but also um, there's something that's changed a lot as, as, as more films being made, which is premier stipulation. Now, I've been doing this long enough to know when all the festivals in the UK, some of them were called by a different name, you know, um, and they all had different premier stipulations and they have fallen by the wayside. But what has happened is a focus on screening films that have not had exposure elsewhere, which is not the same as premier. Because if a festival is saying it has to be a UK premier, it limits what can be submitted to them. If they're saying we prefer films that haven't had so much exposure actually helps filmmakers because it means that the festival is willing to take a risk on perhaps a film that hasn't had a lot of screenings elsewhere. So I kind of feel like it's, it's kind of twofold with BFI in that it is a very prolific festival for UK filmmakers, but also at the same time, if you have, um, and I can tell you this, if you have had a BFI funded film, you still have to submit you still have to pay a submission fee, um, which I personally think is a little bit odd because they generally will create a separate um, strand of like BFI backed films that they want to highlight. So it's, it's not even competing. It's like a separate strand. Again, they haven't done that the last couple of years because of, you know, the, the pandemic throwing all of the programming into a new a new kind of line. So it, yeah, it's there's there's so many little caveats that perhaps we have a bit more access to than your average filmmaker, yeah. um, which most people find really dull and boring. But that's kind of my bread and butter. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And you know, another observation that I that I've made is that 
you know, a lot of festivals are in the business of bums on seats as well, naturally, and, and creating yeah, yeah. eye catching. So the inclusion of recognizable talent is a big thing. You know, if you've got, I don't know, Rosamund Pike or David Tennant or somebody, and you've managed to get them down for an afternoon for a couple of shots, and you can stick them, you know, on that, uh, you know, on that hero image in the brochure, programmers are going to quite like that. And unfortunately, all I can really say to that is, you know, well, welcome to the film business because that permeates that that it, that, that, that reverence of, of talent and that marketability of, of named talent. It, it's a, it's at every single level. So it is an unfortunate thing. Uh, that said, I was I was very much responsive to, to what Katie was saying towards the end of that presentation about kind of going into battle for film festivals and smaller festivals, but getting yourself there, talking to people, networking without networking. Again, you know, these are all things that we recommend people do. And it's things that I love. And I know that, that Katie loves doing as well. You know, that, that whole immersion thing. I mean, I came, down, I came down with COVID because I spent four days doing nothing but talking to people's ears at, at Sundance London, which was the, sorry if anyone was at that festival and you're watching it later and you all laid it with COVID. It probably wasn't just me, but that was one of my first, you know, in-person festivals for, for quite some time. And it was magic and it was really interesting. And to learn what people are doing and you get an opportunity, don't be one of those shy filmmakers that again, you know, goes there with a literal kind of pitch. Be natural, just infuse about what you're doing and, and why you're doing it. And you can do that in, you know, some tiddly little festival in the middle of nowhere, or you can, you know, just rock up to the party at, at Edinburgh or LFF. And that enthusiasm will work. So keep in there at, at the cold face with that enthusiasm. And Katie has it right there. Don't be dispirited. Mm, yeah, I will say like a lot of the times um, it's an ongoing joke with myself and the team that we don't when we go to a film festival we don't actually get time to watch the films no because we're either talking to filmmakers we're meeting clients for the first time or we're, we're doing something for the festival that might be a panel or judging or curator whatever um but we're still there at the festival we're still kind of you know enjoying the opportunity to meet people and to see an audience and um and sometimes, you know, the best conversations you have are because you're bonding over something you didn't like. Yeah. Um, and we've had that before where we've just kind of gone, you know, and like the, the festival uh, Mammoth Lakes we went to, they had an issue with the DCP for the opening night film. There was a film that I'd wanted to see for ages. It's a documentary called Fire of Love. And I'd missed it. Oh, it's yeah. Yeah, several other festivals I'd missed it. So I was like, oh, great. I'm here for the opening night, get to see it really nice kind of small intimate space but there was an issue with the the dcp and um it was well it was an issue with the the projector basically the bulb kept thinking that uh it wasn't working so it would turn it would shut the shutter for 30 seconds so you get audio with no image oh. and then that would happen every five minutes so they'd restart it a few times and they said look we can, it, this is the issue, they explained it. They said, we can either carry on watching like this if you want to stick around or we'll put another screening on in the next day and you can come back. And I was like, I can't watch a film like that, especially because it had subtitles, it had right. diagrams I wanted to view. So then what we did is we were like, let's go to the hub. Let's go to the festival hub, at, you know, two hours earlier than we planned because the after party was there. And what we did is we went there and we were just chatting to the festival volunteers and, and helping them set up and, and in it, if anything, we just got extra time to talk to filmmakers. So, you know, you never you never miss an opportunity. I think the worst thing to do is go to a festival thinking, I'm not going to have achieved anything unless I do this and I get that and I speak to that person and everything else. You've achieved the, the maximum by making a film and getting it selected. That's like two hurdles which are, you know, you will overcome a time and time again, but you should make each and single every single time it happens special. Um, yeah. Because otherwise you you miss opportunities and, and you know, you'll be like two months down the line, you'll be like, I film screened at a festival, but I didn't go. Why didn't I go? And it'll just be because you just thought it wasn't worth it. But then you'll see the the images and you'll see the feedback and you'll be like, why don't you know? So I I again I always go back to this this idea that you should only be spending money at festivals you want to get selected at. And I'm that's like my, my mantra for the rest of my life because I'm so I'm so frustrated and angry 
at filmmakers and on behalf of filmmakers who don't do that they just go click crazy spend a lot of money and then go oh, i don't want to i don't want to play there anymore you're like but you spent the money there what made you you click it you know there must be something um and it's generally impatience so i think you know that's why i always think like if you got turned down for a festival even if it is a small festival if you can go go because it might be that you go and go i'm glad i didn't get in there because it was badly organized at least you know you know or you might go there and go i'm annoyed and i didn't get selected because it's a really good festival but now i know i'm going to submit my next one there so you can always you can always learn something and i always say it's the same as going to see bad theater you learn not what to do so you know it's, it's always a good way of, of just approaching the film circuit is always be learning. Couldn't couldn't agree more. And I, I've, I've got a question as well for you, Katie. I just discovered, literally before we came on air, uh, and I'm obviously very late to it, but Edinburgh Film Festival has moved back to August. Yes. Where it hasn't been for, I don't know, what, 12 years? Something like a that? Long, a long stretch. A long, a long time. Stretch, yeah, and, yeah. and I used to go when it was in August and what a scene it was it was fantastic and we're going up there with our, our this practice as well so we partnered with the Edinburgh Festival Fringe on stage productions this year so we've been doing some seminars and stuff with them and we've got I think a dozen or 15 different uh projects that we're backing supporting playing the Edinburgh Festival Fringe that's a very long-winded way of getting around to the question I'm definitely going because when it used to be in August and it used to be in person, it used to be my favourite British industry festival and people would go and hang out. Obviously, very heavy Scottish scene, but I liked their events. I liked their networking. I, I liked the character in the scene. What, what do you think, Kate? Is it going to be like that? Is it going to be any good this year? I'm, I'm intrigued because it's going, to, it's going to be the first one back, which is open to mm. general public, because obviously last year they did uh, kind of invitation kind of focus on Scottish talent because it was when the restrictions were still so, in place. So tiny, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm intrigued because I remember it being then, because I used to go to the Ed Fringe. So I used to go to the Ed Fringe and then kind of catch people yeah. that were going to the TV and the and also the publishing festival too. So it was a it was really kind of hectic, but in a good way. That's um, right, yeah. And then when they separated them, that it I I personally felt thought there was a little bit of distance so it meant that you know people were having to really make that decision as an industry professional do I take time out to go in June um but it's funny how how much of a difference two months can make because you know the weather's better well generally the weather's better um but also yeah having it alongside Ed Fringe again it's going to be interesting I don't I'm I'm not able to make it because I'm in America for all of August wow. but I'm intrigued I'm intrigued. I shall, I shall fire. I shall file a report. I, I, I guess my point was to to the uh, to everyone on the chat here. I think that's quite a good festival um, for precisely that kind of networking and hanging out and having the crack. So hopefully see you there. It's very easy to find Katie. It's very easy to find Ian and Mark and and the rest of the festival formula team. They are loyal and long standing partners. We love working with them. We love talking to them. We love the. Um, Hanging out on events like this, it's, it's been fantastic. So thank you so much. No worries. Uh, quick reminder, Barnes Film Festival tomorrow. Yeah, there you go. If, if you want to learn more from Katie, you can go and find her over drink. Barnes Film Festival tomorrow. You'll also yes. meet Grace from Greenwich. She'll be there. And that should be a good one. And follow our socials. It's Greenlit Fund. It's Festival Formula on all the usual. Am I right? Festival Formula on... Yeah, all yeah, on everything. Anticipated yeah. platforms. And we are Greenlit Fund on all the obvious platforms you can find us um thanks again katie thanks everybody for joining keep making those films never say die keep persistent because there is a festival screening with your name on it right out there good night everyone good night take care everyone bye